Hey everybody, it's Mike with the Quit Sugar Summit. Uh, I'm here today with David Wiss and uh, David is somebody I spoke to a couple of years ago on the summit and uh, was, we had a great talk, lively talk. He's here in Los Angeles and uh, he's pursuing a, a PhD in public health, but he's already a, has a master's degree in nutrition as a nutritionist, but more importantly, has a very interesting company and business uh, called Nutrition and Recovery, which is like, I mean, it's, <laughs> For me, it's it's the it's perfect sense, you know. The gateway drug is sugar, and that you can't get into treatment, and then all of a sudden be on junk food and coffee and cigarettes, and expect that you're going to have results. And David, I think, is of the same mind of that. But uh, yeah, I'm really happy to have him here. We're going to have a great discussion. Just had a great uh, paper published uh, uh, in one of the prestigious journals, and we're going to talk about it. You bring it up and talk about it. But uh, I'm going to let him tell you about that. David, how are you, man? Fantastic, Mike. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor and a privilege to talk about such important topics to me. And yes, uh, nutrition and recovery is really aiming to bridge the gap between physical and mental health and try to talk about nutrition in a new way and to uh, open up people's minds about possibilities. And hopefully we'll do a little bit of that today. All right. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, the way I was reading it over, you know, I mean, I'm <laughs> not as much of an academic as you are, um, but it was, it, you know, I got through it and it was interesting as hell because we've been talking about this and it, obviously this summit and work that I've done over the years and the, the folks that I've worked with and, and we clash a little bit with the eating disorder folks in that they don't want to demonize one food. Like they say that you should be able to moderate uh, sugar and flour and different things for some people. And for, you know, I've came, and I think you may know this, but I come from uh, understanding and working with late stage food addicts. And now I'm trying to broaden that so that more people get this information and awareness. And I think they're just a little nervous of that. Uh, you know, every time they talk to their eating disorder specialist, they say, well, you should be able to leave just a little sugar. Some folks should be able to, I don't know. It's so, it's a complex thing, and I think you're going to go over it pretty decently. So, yeah, I've uh, certainly been watching the complexities unfold over the years. One of the things that's I think interesting about my journey is that academically, I've written a lot of papers about sugar addiction and food addiction because mm -hmm. of my interest in neuroscience. Right, as a person interested in ind addiction in general. You know, once you study one addiction, you're going to learn about other addictions, caffeine, nicotine, sugar, drugs, alcohol, behavioral addictions, and you really learn how much overlap there is. So uh, in my scholarly pursuits, I've done a lot of work on food addiction. However, clinically, I work with a lot of people that have eating disorders that do well with an inclusive nutrition approach, right? So mm -hmm. it's an interesting kind of... Um, two-sided coin that I get to flip often. And, you know, I like to say that there's a very dichotomized way of thinking about it for people. It seems like for most people, you're either in one camp or you're in the other. Right. People don't seem to be able to hold uh, seemingly opposingly, seemingly opposing truth simultaneously true, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's been my experience that people uh, identify with either exclusive nutrition approaches based on sugar addiction and food addiction science, or they believe in inclusive nutrition approaches based uh, exposure in a more classic eating disorder sense. And so, you know, in my journey, both professionally and academically, I've always scratched my head and said, well, you know, there's gotta be something in between. There's gotta be a way to help people figure out where they fall on this continuum or this spectrum and it seemed like my efforts to talk about these issues in an integrated fashion made a lot of people nervous because mm. people seem to be very tribal when it comes to science as well as <laughs> nutrition, right? So sure. people want to identify with a group. And so as soon as you say certain words, people automatically assume, for example, as soon as uh, someone hears the term sugar addiction or food addiction, people think that you're associated with diet culture, that mm. you're part of some kind of evil force. And then as soon as people say moderation, all right, inclusive, all foods fit, the, the sugar addiction people think, oh, they're totally missing the boat. What do they work for the food industry, right? Mm -hmm. And so I've been able to see the split 
And you know, one of the uh, major efforts that I've made in the last few years is to try to have a discussion about where uh, it meets in the middle and how we can make peace and have some uh, consensus rather than argument. Nice. I love that. I love. I see it so often. It's crazy that people will come in thinking about sugar addiction or whatever, and and then they say their food addiction counselor said that they can't, they, you know, they can't demonize one food or whatever. But also, I see it, you know, really deeply that people, some people, a percentage of people, when they ingest sugar, they just want more and they can't stop. It's I love this explanation. Bitten's on our, uh, our summit, and she has been doing this for so long. And it's an interesting description, and I'd like to know your thoughts on it, where she describes uh, bulimia and anorexia, which is where, really where most of the eating disorder folks came up from, their schools, as process addictions similar to uh, gambling or sex addiction or work addiction. But she describes true food, or true sugar addiction, true you know uh, processed food addiction as a substance use disorder, where they're uh, you know once the chemical, the biochemical reaction is in their body, they you know they can't they don't have control literally of their nucleus accumbens of their their brain chemicals. They 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 have to have more right, and without abstinence, then they don't do well. I wonder if you maybe could comment on that kind of, I know you've been talking about it, but kind of directly comment on that, that split. Yeah, that's a great one. You know, uh, it's a really good and important distinction uh, between substance related disorders and behavioral or process addictions. Um, you know, there's clearly defined process addictions like shopping and gambling, right. um, pornography, et cetera. But, you know, where I'm trying to add to the conversation isn't that we need to uh, split things into two different things. We need to think about how they uh, co-occur mm -hmm. and how they cluster and how they meet in the middle. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you know, if it were true that, you know, true, pure, quote unquote, bulimia had um, was a process addiction and, 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 and sugar addiction was a substance use disorder, you're going to find people that have both. <laughs> right. and, and it's like, okay, so now what? Right? Right, right. And that's where I think uh, language matters a lot. And so mm. I'm really invested in, uh, you know, pushing forward the conversation about the kind of words we use to describe these issues, as well as the language that we give to our, our clients and patients. For example, um, even the word, you know, demonize, like demonizing anything isn't probably going to be beneficial, right? If, if you're trying right. to work toward um, uh, some kind of inner peace or recovery around it, even like with drugs and alcohol, right? I, I identify as a person in long-term recovery and yeah. I don't demonize alcohol or drugs. I respect them, right? Yeah. And I also <laughs> say like, if I could pull it off successfully, I probably would. So I, right. I think that there's a good, you know, point in that like demonizing things can create what I call food negativity. And food negativity can create negative emotions that can actually spiral people in the cycle, right? And so sure. uh, I believe in food positivity and most people would think food positivity means, you know, just, you know, eat intuitively and eat whatever you want. Yeah, and yeah. for a lot of people it does, but I think there's a way to be food positive to have recovery centric language, to uh, uh, support certain types of inclusion, non-diet approaches, and to honor the fact that certain constituents of food, certain ingredients hijack the reward system. Uh, Those don't have to be competing ideas. Right. And so that's the, the, the real challenge. And so, you know, to answer your question, I think that uh, there's a lot of eating disorders that would be better matched as you know, uh, a process addiction, some that would be better fit as a substance related disorder. But um, uh, to, to disentangle that is really tricky because most yeah. people will have characteristics of both. I like that. That's great. And you, know, you find that in all kinds of addictions, you know, uh, crossovers of every kind and, you know, substituting one for the other and whatever, you know, right. that's cool.
So you did, you, you've got that great paper that just got published. Maybe you can tell the folks a little bit about what that's about. And uh, I think you have a copy of it, maybe show Yeah, it. let's pull it up. This has been a, a, a long work in progress. I'm really excited to announce that it was published in the Nutrients Journal um, within the last month. Mm. And the title is called Separating the Signal from the Noise. And you know, that's sometimes a, a term we use in statistics and some other applications. Essentially what it means is you want to get a really clear signal, uh, an association, and oftentimes it's muddled out by a lot of other factors. So in uh, data science, we really want to uh, draw a causal inference and figure out like what's the real signal rather mm -hmm. than the noise, right? So in statistical models, we make adjustments to really capture the signal. And with food addiction, there's a really clear signal, right? Like there's tools, there's neuroimaging data. I mean, obviously most people know the Yale Food Addiction Scale. Now in the 2.0, there's the modified version. There's a hundred, hundreds of papers. It's used, used worldwide. Uh, it's hard to debate that signal, but the argument people are making is that there's a lot of noise. And so you can't be really confident in the signal when there's a lot of noise and what I've identified as the noise is dietary restraint, also known as restrictive eating. So the, the main gist of the paper is to figure out how we can use psychiatric diagnoses that I'll talk about today, things like substance use disorder, uh, PTSD, um, depression, ADHD, to really figure out if someone truly has food addiction or if it's just a relic of dieting behavior. And so let me just clarify that before we go in further. Sure. The argument of, against food addiction that people have that I've been hearing and I think is valid is that when people are dieting excessively, and this has been shown in animal models as well as in, in some human studies, that it increases their food addiction symptoms. So for example, if someone is body dissatisfied and they really just want to lose 10 pounds because they're uncomfortable in the body that they live in, and they start doing restrictive uh, diets or maybe you know cutting out whole food groups or entire macronutrients, it'll actually make their food addiction symptoms increase, okay? And so the, the, the conversation that we're starting to have is like, okay, if, if that's the case, what's causing what? Did the food addiction cause the dieting or did the dieting cause the food addiction? Mm. And this is the split in between those two camps that I described. The classic eating disorder uh, tribe that I do identify as being a part of would say all dieting drives food addiction. And people that are of the sugar addiction variety would say sugar addiction and food addiction drives dieting. And I think that's where people are very um, split. And so the paper was designed to help people discern between the two to help figure out which one may have came first, right? In, uh, in mental health treatment, you know, figuring out the temporal sequence of disorders can be very, very helpful. Uh, especially when you look at, you know, clustering, co-occurring issues like food addiction, uh, drug addiction, eating disorders. When I'm doing clinical treatment, I'm, 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 I'm often wondering, you know, which one emerged first which one's a byproduct of another one. And that information is extremely helpful for me when conceptualizing a, uh, a, a treatment plan. So, you know, the, uh, um, you know, one of the key points in the abstract is that I, I identify the criticism of food addiction. And, and I think this is a really important thing to do as a scholar, uh, as someone that believes in sugar addiction and believes in food addiction. One of the smartest things I can do is be open to the criticism that exists and look for ways to resolve the debate. So a lot of this paper was um, intended to address this argument that uh, all dieting drives you know, food addiction. So there's a bunch of food addiction research in eating disorder populations, binge eating, uh, bulimia. There's definitely some recent studies with anorexia as well. Um, but like I said, the argument is that if you don't control for dietary restraint in the assessment tool, you might actually have false positives, right? Someone meets criteria, but you didn't adjust for dietary restraint. 
So the purpose of the paper is to help clinicians as well as researchers try to identify what's a true positive, which is what I'm calling the signal from a more classic eating disorder pathology, um, which we're gonna call restraint or dietary restraint, which I'm also referring to as the noise. Uh, th this paper took a, took a lot of time. And you know, like I said, in, in science, uh, it's easy to be biased and cherry pick data. It's really easy. It's called confirmation bias. When I believe in something, I'm gonna look for evidence that confirms what I already know and believe, right? But in a real um, academic publication, a review article, you gotta be unbiased, right? To the best of our ability. So, you know, like I said, I'm identifying the common cr criticisms of food addiction in the fact that it doesn't detect people's tendencies to restrict food intake for weight control. So it doesn't have measures of dieting behavior. It doesn't have measures of body um, dissatisfaction. Um, another point I want to make is that, you know, there's some really important discussions around stigma these days, particularly as it relates to weight, particularly as it weights, uh, relates to addictions and substance use disorders. And so an important thing to consider with food addiction is, right, does this idea of food addiction increase stigma or does it decrease it? In other words, does the term food addiction stigmatize individuals or does it help people kind of absolve themselves of this personal responsibility? A lot of people are really hard on themselves because they can't change the way they eat. You know, they try to make improvements and then they're back to the sugar, they're back to the things. And a lot of people end up, you know, being really hard on themselves because they feel like it's a failure of, you know, personal responsibility. So I think as you probably know, Mike, when you give someone the right information, when you give someone the right information about sugar addiction or food addiction, it can actually help someone feel more free. It's like, ah, now I understand what's going on with me, right? It's not so much that uh, I failed, it's that my, my reward centers have been altered in a way that's gonna promote the behavior despite negative consequences, right? That's very effective, yes, very effective. It's, it's very effective, you know, as, 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 as educators, we know that once you give people the description of the problem in, 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 a, in, a, in a more uh, true and effective way, people can understand what the solution might be, right? Mm -hmm. One of the biggest criticisms of food addiction and sugar addiction is that the problem has been well documented. There's a lot of evidence to support it, but there isn't a lot of studies to date that show effective interventions, right? And that's where, you know, someone like me wants to come in and say, all right, well, let's think about how can we, how can we do this? There's 12 step fellowships that have been successful for decades, right? Mm -hmm. You know, hundreds of people, thousands of people that have recovered. Mm -hmm. The problem is that it isn't documented in the scientific literature. So people that are trying to be unbiased, you know, are often thinking about, well, where's the, where's the data, right? Sure. And, um, you know, as a clinician, I, I've seen people have market improvements in their health based on, you know, this, this information. Um, one example of data that is out there, this was recent from the UK, it suggests that over a nine year period, they looked at, I think over 100,000 medical records, the probability of a man going from an obese BMI to a normal BMI was one in 210. And for a woman, it was one in 124. So people are quoting things like the, the, uh, the likelihood of successfully dieting or losing weight is less than 1%, mm. right? And sure. you know, the argument that's being made is that if dieting quote unquote, doesn't work, I'll call it quote unquote dieting, because mm. that's not well-defined by the way, right? Sure. Um, if it doesn't work, then it should be uh, unethical to prescribe people diets, right? Mm. But I think as, as we've discussed, and as you know, it depends on how you define diet and it depends on the information that people are getting, right? If it's just a calorie model, if it's just to eat less and exercise more model, that doesn't seem to work. But if, if, if it's a eat differently, become interested in the quality of your food, the ingredients of your food, learn how to cook your own food. That's a totally uh, different conversation. Um, what's also emerging as an important issue, 
like I said, is, you know, weight stigma. And, you know, like I, like I mentioned, a lot of people based on the available data are saying that, you know, this is now a social justice issue to, to, to prescribe people diets uh, when there's no data to support it works is a, uh, uh, it's an unethical approach. And rather we need to address weight stigma and fat shame in our society. And mm -hmm. I certainly uh, agree with that, but let's be real for a minute, right? Eating disorder treatment is not that successful. There's a lot of relapse and poor long-term outcomes. And as we talked about earlier with the eating disorder models, looking at it as, you know, behavioral, uh, emotional, psychological, you know, their message is that it's not about the food and they give very little attention to the biological factors that drive binge eating, right? Mm -hmm. And those of us that understand sugar addiction and food addiction do focus on the biology more than just the kind of psychosocial factors involved. Key point I wanna make, uh, we know that dieting drives binging, and dieting drives uh, food cravings, but it's been shown recently that by depriving food, yes, it increases cravings in the beginning, but over the long term, food cravings eventually go away. And that's a really important message that we need to carry. It's like, yes, when people try to like stop abruptly, craving gets high, symptoms get high, but if you stick around, and you move off, if you wean off of these things and you stay off of them, eventually you don't want them anymore. Mm. And, and, and how long that takes is going to be different for some people. Some people, you know, have a pink cloud effect and after, you know, three months, they feel great. But let's be real, Mike, like real long-term recovery at the neurobiological level, these are things that take three, four, five, six, seven years, right? To where nice. you're truly neutral, you're truly neutral to the food stuff. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, create an incentive. There's not, the cues aren't uh, mm. salient. It's not gonna hijack your uh, thought processes or make you think excessively about it. You get free. Mm. And people aren't really sticking around long enough, you know, for the, for the miracle to happen. But I think as most people on the summit know is that for people that do eventually, you know, there's access to a, a freedom that most people didn't think was ever, ever possible. Mm -hmm. So the key feature of the review article is three clinical vignettes. I talk about several psychiatric diagnoses that I'm not going to cover in, in detail just because of the time, but I, I provided three clinical vignettes, which are, um, you know, fictitious case studies to mm -hmm. really capture different phenotypes of eating pathology, okay? And this is designed for people to take a look at them and say, ah, I understand how these, these people can be very different, but have the same food addiction uh, uh, symptom count, right? So if you just use a, an assessment tool, you can have people that have the same score, but have very different backgrounds, uh, very different co-occurring psychopathology, and that would benefit from most likely very different treatments. So I have three phenotypes that I described and uh, I encourage people to read these. This article is open access, which means if you were to just Google the title, you could download it that easy. But I, I went through three different cases and you know, case A, phenotype A, you know, is a, is a really clear example of food addiction, what I call a true positive, and it's not blocked by the noise of dietary restraint. So there was an absence of restrictive eating in this particular case. And so therefore there was little convincing evidence that the addiction is driven by dieting or, or, or some kind of internalized weight bias or other forms of compensatory mechanisms. Uh, for example, socially constructed forces such as weight stigma. So this particular case wasn't body dissatisfaction. It wasn't eating disorder. It was trauma, uh, early life adversity, uh, mixed with uh, uh, adolescent adversity, and it uh, culminated with disrupted reward patterns and dysfunctional eating uh, on the overeating spectrum with no evidence of dieting, right? And so to me, it's painting a really clear picture of food addiction. The second case uh, uh, was a, a, a male case. It was an example of how it was very noisy, 
okay? It was a false positive. So uh, this particular person that, that we call Jeffrey, he, he was clearly a dieter and his dieting drove the food addiction symptoms. He didn't have food addiction until, you know, he really lost uh, control. A lot of people have control, quote unquote, control for a long time, and then mm -hmm. they lose it. In his case, you know, he went through some, some challenges. He had a medication change. He became depressed and, you know, he's taken off a stimulant and put on a, a antidepressant and things started to change and uh, he started purging and then the food addiction symptoms went through the roof. Mm -hmm. He had thin ideals perpetuated by his family system. And so it was a case where, yes, it looked like food addiction, but it truly wasn't. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, uh, phenotype C is uh, kind of one of these ch challenging case studies where you scratch your head and you say, I don't know, it could go either way. It could be a, a clear food addiction signal, or it could be a more classic eating disorder presentation. And the, the point that I've made in the paper is that it's going to depend on the training. And I also say the bias of the practitioner. So depending on how someone views food related pathology is most likely how they're going to conceptualize, diagnose and intervene, right? So uh, it's, really, um, it's really fun to consider what theoretical underpinnings people have when they look at problems. Like what is your training? Where did you learn that? And in, in order to understand where people are coming from and why there are such uh, splits in our field. Mm. And then lastly, I uh, propose an eight step process to help people discern food addiction from dietary restraint. And this is where the psychiatric diagnoses uh, come into play. Uh, I, I use the Yale Food Addiction Scale 2.0 because it's um, validated, it's recognized, and there's been a lot of studies as well as updates on, on the measure. So if someone meets food addiction criteria, I say, okay, let's move on to the next assessment, okay? Once we've established there's food addiction, then we want to figure out, is there dietary restraint? And I've included some tools that someone could use to assess if there's dietary restraint. And um, if there's not, you'd say, okay, this is, this is food addiction. If someone has food addiction symptoms and they don't have a lot of dieting, you can say clearly that it's likely to be relevant. But if there is dieting, then you want to think about which one came first. Is it the food addiction or the dieting, right? And, and to go further, you would then want to assess someone's history of substance use disorder. Um, it could be self-reported. If someone has a history of substance use disorder, you know that there's reward dysfunction. You know that their dopamine system is altered, right? Yeah. And so obviously you can use um, self-report for someone's addiction history, but there's also some important ways that we can look at uh, someone's levels of impulsivity or to look at other cross addictions. So when I meet people in my office or on Zoom worldwide, you know, I'm really curious about their relationship to other things. Like I said before, caffeine, nicotine, because that helps me figure out if they're a true, uh, you know, biological phenotype of addiction, if they have the mm -hmm. altered neurochemistry that we know exists, right? Sure. Um, and so if someone is, uh, uh, you know, negative, it doesn't mean that they aren't a food addict because there's a lot of people that only have an addiction to food. Some people find food early and they don't find other drugs because the impact of food is so significant that it like drugs and alcohol can't even compete with that, right? <laughs> Some people have found food at such a young age. And by the time they were 15, when the drugs and alcohol came around, food was so primary that they never even got into those other drugs. So if someone doesn't have okay. a substance use disorder, it doesn't mean they don't have food addiction. But if they do, uh, we're going to say that food addiction is likely to be relevant. And then again, you want to consider the temporal sequence. Which one came first? Was it the food addiction or the substance use disorder? A lot of people develop food addiction after they get clean. Right. Yep. They experience yep. with drugs and alcohol. And once they get clean, the, uh, the, the eating behavior gets totally out of hand. And it's because they stopped using meth or alcohol or whatever it was. And so that might be a little different than if someone had food addiction first and drug addiction later. 
And so again, it's really important to look at all these possible diagnoses and to try to piece it together in terms of temporal sequence. And then where this paper gets really, uh, you know, I think useful, and I have another paper in the same special issue about more about early life adversity and trauma. There's strong links between trauma, particularly in the first 18 years of life and uh, addictions in general. Okay. Mm, so, you sure. know, the data suggests people that have been exposed to adverse childhood experience have sometimes five to tenfold increase in, um, in uh, uh, drug use patterns. I did a systematic review and meta-analysis on ACE scores, which is adverse childhood experiences and BMI, mm. obesity. And our findings suggest that those that were exposed to multiple ACEs, so ACEs are things like um, emotional neglect, physical neglect, sexual abuse, parents fighting in the home, uh, divorce, separation, parental mental illness, uh, that kind of thing. People that are exposed to adverse childhood experiences have a 46% a, a increase in the odds of obesity, okay? And that was after adjusting, that was a meta-analysis. So it's a pretty robust estimate. And, uh, you know, I think it's really important that we, you know, advance the conversation around trauma and around um, uh, reward, right? And so any, any conceptualization of sugar addiction and food addiction that doesn't consider both PTSD symptoms as well as early life adversity is totally missing an important part of the, of the biopsychosocial puzzle. Mm -hmm. So my next recommendation is to assess for a PTSD and I've recommended some tools. And, you know, if, um, if, if, if someone's, you know, positive, right, it, it, it's really suggesting that food addiction is likely to be relevant and that's independent of a substance use disorder history. However, if someone has PTSD and substance use disorder, it really strengthens the confidence in the food addiction signal. And then once I've determined uh, PTSD-like symptoms, then we go back even further and look at early life adversity. And I've recommended some tools. The most well-known one, like I said, is the ACE score. And in, in my professional opinion, and this is um, you know, also supported by the literature reviewed herein, that if someone has, um, you know, food addiction, there's no dietary restraint, they have a substance use disorder, they have PTSD symptoms, and they have early life adversity, um, that food addiction is a really clear signal. Uh, it's a really clear signal. And you could say this is happening for this person, uh, which might at this point indicate exclusive or restricted nutritional strategies. But I have a caveat here. It only works if there's adequate resources including social support, like some of your groups, Mike, right? Being able to go to a 12-step thing, having friends around who are also doing that, as well as access to nutritious and unprocessed foods. So just because someone has the, the food addiction, it doesn't mean that the treatment's necessarily going to work, right? Even if they know it, in order for the treatment to work, they have to be around other like-minded people. They have to understand the... Um, the, the picture, whether it be the biology of it or just the concept of it. And in my opinion, you're, no, one's gonna, no one's gonna thrive in a sugar addiction and food addiction recovery if they're out there eating commercialized foods because sugar's a, it's hidden in everything, right? Mm -hmm. So the only way to really um, maximize chances of recovery for, for, for most people is to learn how to cook your own food. And I think you know, most people would uh, agree with that. Sure. Do you push uh, 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 cooking with We do, family? absolutely. You it's it's to, right? mandatory, yeah. Yeah, there's no way to, to be a consumer of, um, you know, commercialized food and expect to uh, not have your reward systems sure. hijacked, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I, uh, I, I added some consideration of depression, anxiety, and ADHD that people can uh, learn more about if, if you look at uh, the paper. But, um, you know, one of the key points, and I think we made this point earlier, is that when someone has both eating disorder and food addiction, that we should view it on a continuum rather than as discrete conditions. So rather than saying it's either this or that, you know, if we use the eight step guide, we can see where someone falls on this spectrum rather than just to dichotomize them as you need to be 
uh, dietary uh, inclusive or dietary exclusive. And I think uh, at this point, most people know what inclusive versus exclusive means. And to summarize, you know, I used these three clinical vignettes, you know, that extended my previous work, which was the DFANG model by adding trauma and PTSD history, particularly early in life, as well as some of these other psychiatric diagnoses to really guide the treatment strategy. Uh, I've recognized dietary restraint as the primary contributor of noise in the FAA signal. You know, and because of this, a lot of um, eating disorder professionals reject the sugar addiction, food addiction construct altogether. Mm. And you know, that's gonna stick around for a while because people have really dug their toes in on that one. And I don't see people budging on that. So I see a lot of conflict in upcoming years around this conversation, you know, um, but I think as we integrate our knowledge of trauma, PTSD and early life adversity more, I think people will become more open to the possibility that, you know, the neurophysiologies change in ways that need to be acknowledged. Um, so yes, the proper interpretation of a food addiction Diagnosis uh, should improve treatment for those who would benefit from, from different nutritional approaches, uh, such as excluding problematic foods like added refined sugars. There are people that need to approach it that way. And uh, it's not everyone, but we need to figure out who those people are and how to get them the right, um, you know, the right strategies. And then lastly, you know, one of the key features of the paper is the argument that there's also a need for tailor-made hybrid models between the inclusive and the exclusive. Uh, that's been really useful for me clinically, but have not yet been formally described or tested. Oftentimes these kind of interventions require, require a little bit of trial and error. You know, there's some people that can do well with, you know, whole grain, but not with refined grain. And there's people that don't do well with grains at all, right? And these are things that are gonna differ from person to person. You know, you meet people that don't do well with you know, ref refined sugar, but seem to do, you know, okay with honey. And there's other people that honey is the same exact thing as sugar, right? There's yeah. so many nuances to these things that you can't scale treatment without, in, in, in a lot of cases, you do need some kind of um, individualized uh, approaches. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, I proposed a couple future directions, like doing, you know, prospective trials where, you know, you separate people into these different diet arms, you know, but you know, I also make the argument that instead of just, you know, separating people into these different groups, it would be even better if we discerned people and got them into the right group to see how everyone could get the beneficial treatment for them rather than which one's right and which one's wrong. But there's a couple important questions that remain unanswered, you know, uh, and, I, and I like to make this point for the, you know, eating disorder camp if it's true that dieting drives binge eating and food addiction, where does all the dieting come from in the first place? Why is it that everyone's dieting, right? And this is where I put my public health hat on, say everyone's dieting because the, the food environment's toxic right. and it is, uh, you know, there's a lot of factors leading people to being unsatisfied with their bodies and that needs to be considered a, as well. And we need to think about the socio-cultural influences that have ingrained highly palatable foods into our brain's reward expectancies. People learn from a young age to expect a certain effect by sugar and they carry that through their lifespan. And then, you know, can public health interventions aimed at reducing exposure to highly processed foods eventually reduce food addiction and then subsequently reduce the chronic dieting. So to summarize and conclude, individual treatment might be helpful based on the existence of food addiction, but only after it's been determined that the food addiction signal represents an addiction to food, what I call a true positive, rather than a consequence of dietary restraint, food insecurity, or other forms of deprivation or food-related neglect. Mm -hmm. So uh, dismissing food addiction entirely, in my opinion, is ill-informed and not helpful. I think food addiction may warrant consideration as a distinct category in the DSM-5, uh, I do think it would be better fit as a substance use disorder. And I think once that happens, if that happens, which, you know, I'm skeptical to be honest, because it really does point the finger at the food industry and their pockets are so deep. And I just don't see, I just, mm. I just don't see it happening to be perfectly honest. Like I'm happy mm. to treat it. I'm happy to advocate for it. But once you put it in as a substance use disorder, 
it's going to, it's going to warrant a lot of, you know, uh, capitalistic change that I think people will be pushing back on, but I'm in for the fight, man. I, uh, I believe <laughs> in it. I know you believe in it. You're on, you're on the board and I know a lot of people that are saying it, but you know, I've come to realize that private profits do seem to win over public health and it's mm. a really unfortunate situation. And that's really what's going on, you know, in our, uh, in, in our world, sadly. But I, I do think that, you know, if it, if it ever was and there was more research that could happen both at the individual and group level, it could really, um, you know, push forward the public health efforts to improve the national and international uh, food environment. And I think there are some other countries that have made some changes. Uh, Dr. Lustig has a paper in the, same, uh, in the same special issue. So if you go to this paper, you click on the special issue. Uh, where he talks about some of these uh, challenges at the at the global level, so I highly recommend reading that one, this one, and then the other paper I have with Dr. Avina and Dr. Gold on early life psychosocial adversity. Unbelievable, man! I mean, your articulation and the uh, reduction of this very uh, scholarly paper, so that folks can understand it was just great. I really appreciate that. And it's so important. This work that you're doing is so important because people are just flat out confused. They're just having a hard time with it. They don't know who to listen to. They don't, you know, even folks that, I think I've told you this story before, but when I went public with my substance use disorder, I got this flood of people in recovery who had uh, 5, 10, 15, 20 years sober, but could not put down the sugar. They didn't understand what happened to them. And these are folks that had access to treatment centers and 12-step meetings and everything. And they just, they had been to the 12-step food group. They still couldn't stop it, you know? So you mentioned a couple things that, <clears throat> that are very interesting in my world. And I get a little bit of hate mail and different things. <laughs> um, body positivity and social justice issue around um body shaming now obviously no one wants to uh, that's not something anyone would advocate for but and you don't have to answer this question but you know this idea that <clears throat> the possibility could be that uh, and a lot of people that have recovered quote unquote who were advocates there's very few yet but there are a few said they didn't really want to be overweight they didn't want they wanted to help control what was going on in their life but they felt powerless. What are your What are your thoughts on that as a public, a future PhD public health uh, person? Like, what's what's going to happen with that movement, with that uh, you know that thought process? Yeah, thanks for that. I think what's what's a, a persistent issue is that there are some people that are able to easily modify their body weight. For example, getting off of the sugar addiction roller coaster. Mm -hmm. But there's an increasingly number of people that aren't. And, and what I mean by that is they have metabolic issues. Their adipose tissue has been around long enough. It's really stubborn. Uh, people might have hormonal issues, other environmental toxins. The uh, childhood adversities becomes you know, biologically embedded. Their, their stress response is different. Their cortisol is high. There are an increasingly number, a growing number of people that aren't able to be in what some of the 12 step fellowships call the hundred pound club, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and I think it's, it's really difficult on those people when they compare themselves to other people that were able to lose a lot of weight going on a diet or doing some kind of sugar addiction, food addiction thing. So the, 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 the weight stigma and the body positivity movement is creating space for these people that, that don't not only don't, uh, aren't able to lose weight, but like, you know, maybe shouldn't try. And I, and I think that that argument is valid just based on what we know about weight loss and about the environment. Mm -hmm. There are some people that, you know, make changes and feel very different, but for the majority of people, efforts to lose weight become misguided and they create a sense of failure and they create, mm -hmm. create a sense of, um, you know, social rejection and isolation that actually works against them. So, you know, dieting is really stressful when people feel like they gave it their all and they failed because they didn't reach their goal weight. It just creates negative emotions that can make eating pathology worse. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So uh, I, I do, uh, you know, support some people that, you know, want to, you know, change the body that they live in, but I stopped assuming that it was, it was, it was easy and accessible for all people because mm. I work one-on-one -on -one with lots of people. And so what I always try to encourage people to do is be body positive and um, accept the body that you live in. And let's start talking about nutrition for mental health. Let's start yeah. changing the way we eat. And let's nice. see what the universe has in store for you nice. rather than assuming that if I do this, you know, calorie and this exercise that I'll be able to be in full control of my weight. I tell people all, all, all the time and it's, it, it lands on people as difficult and bad news, but this is from an expert. This is with my full-time job. Your weight isn't up to you. It's not, your, it's not fully up to you. There's athletes that can change their weight easily. But for most people, your weight isn't simply a choice that you get to decide on based on these external factors. There's mm. so many other things that are going on underneath the skin uh, at the biopsychosocial level that science is only beginning to elucidate. And I didn't even touch on the microbiome, but mm. I think that's a very important factor and predictor of body weight that we're only barely learning more about. Uh, that was great. Thank you. Uh, one of the things also you brought up was, uh, and this is weird because the summit is uh, becoming accidentally, even like the coaches, you know, not professional folk food addiction folks or, you know, MDs or PhDs, you know, they're talking about the mental health issues and the mental health recovery that has, uh, as I said, you know, a lot of the recovering folks that they're in it for, they're not in it for the, their weight was fine. They're in it for the mental peace, the, the lack of depression, the, you know, the, the lack of, uh, one of the things I never hear people talk about anymore, it's usually associated with marijuana, is the um, amotivational syndrome. They literally are more, they, they have more energy, more, more brain power to do stuff. And then the, the, the part of that I think ties right into that is that the food cravings will go away. So it's that concentration, the, the thought process of dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, all it. And I don't think any of it has ever, it, it's not diagnostically possible, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but not diagnostically possible yet in this history to decide how powerful this psychoactive drug is, mm. right? It's not power, possible yet to understand. So it's anecdotal at best that these positive benefits occur to the people who uh, choose abstinence as their modality of recovery or change, right? Yeah. And so what are your thoughts about like uh, the mental health future, the mental health present, the, the literally the effect of this or these uh, processed foods or sugar on the, a person's brain and all that that entails. I know, that, I know that's a two hour, three hour deal, but yeah. you know, if you can encapsulate it. It's the best question, thank you for that. I've totally shifted my clinical focus away from weight loss and toward using nutrition mm -hmm. to improve mood. And at a, at a really basic neurobiological level, if you overactivate your dopamine system, it's really difficult to feel inner peace and joy that's long lasting. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if people are, um, you know, reducing their negative affect and they're, you know, challenging emotional moments through abusing a substance, um, it's really unlikely that they're going to be able to experience the kind of freedom. And it might not even just be, you know, you know, like bliss type freedom. It might just be that their brain doesn't think about things that it shouldn't think about it because it's thinking about things that it should. <laughs> it's focused on having a life with purpose, meaning, and direction. They're able to get more things done. They have a yeah. clear mind. And, and, you know, I'm not of the like, you know, brain fog and some of that stuff's controversial. But what I do know is that if someone has an addiction, your thoughts are hijacked. Mm -hmm. and if you can get free of that, your thought life frees up and you've got all this new space to think of all these new things and think about what someone can contribute to the stream of life after that. Right. Yeah. 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 That's exactly it. That, and that has become same with us. I mean, 
yeah, we tell them the right foods. Yeah, they're talking about weight. And they're, they, I love the saying, I think it originated in 12 step. We come for the sanity or vanity and we stay for the sanity. You know, people come because they're, they're fat. They're, they want to lose weight. They're, they're upset with themselves. But then they start to realize that there's so much more to this after they fall to a right size body. So obviously we're running out of time and I would love to talk for another two hours, but uh, uh, I have something you said. I was, I read all these notes, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> um, but yeah, what, what do you want the world to know that where you're headed, what, what your, your thoughts on, you're obviously very aggressive getting an M, a PhD in public health. You wanna move more to influencing more people. Tell, tell the folks where you're headed with all that. And then yeah, after that, where, where they can find you online. As, as someone that's done individual work for so long, right? The idea of going to you know, pursue a doctorate in public health, and I'm, I'm fourth year now, is to start thinking more about groups to start thinking about policy. Mm -hmm. However, I also, like I mentioned before, know that there's barriers there. And so, you know, I'm very interested in the individual. And I think, uh, you know, what I'd like to see is more research on the link between trauma and eating behavior. And I think I'm very likely to move in that direction and to essentially develop methodologies for treatment and nutrition therapy that are, that are trauma informed and help people understand the same way once someone understands sugar addiction, they can change their eating behavior. Once people understand the biological embedding of adversity and understand what they have to do to overcome some of that, it becomes much more easier to buy into what we're calling recovery, mm. which is, involves a lot for, for people. It's not just say, oh, let's meet once a week with the dietitian. You mm -hmm. know, it might mean doing all kinds of social support, yoga, meditation, you know, drinking two to three liters of water per day. And I think once people understand the, the gravity of the physiology of, you know, early life adversity and PTSD and sleep disruption and all those things a little bit more, I think we can start moving in the direction of healing, uh, wholeness and wellness. Nice. Very cool. Yeah. My, uh, yeah, my website is nutritioninrecovery.com. So that's nutrition, I N recovery.com pretty active on Instagram. I've been going live lately on, on Fridays at 4 PM Pacific time, I cover various topics. I just started a TikTok, So I'm putting out one minute videos every day on addiction recovery. Wow. So I'm talking about all kinds of addictions, uh, substance process addictions, and I'm talking about all kinds of recovery, nice. I'm talking about things like stigma. I'm talking about drugs, alcohol, talking about food and uh, really starting the the conversation on on that platform so uh i'm always happy to connect with new folks you can send a contact uh through my through my website and uh, hopefully there'll be some uh collaboration very cool man that's great with the tiktok and i can attest to the uh uh the instagram lives every friday are really really good so you guys should check those out thank you David, thank you so much, man. This has been awesome. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. And uh, we'll, uh, now that we know we're right in the same city, we got to get together after this COVID thing. That sounds great. All right, man. Take care. Bye-bye.